Chapter 31 Balaam The Israelites moved forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side of Jordan by Jericho. Balak, the king of the Moabites, saw that the Israelites were a powerful people, and as they learned that they had destroyed the Amorites and had taken possession of their land, they were exceedingly terrified. All Moab was in trouble, and Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam the son of Beor to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. Balaam had been a prophet of God and a good man, but he apostatized and gave himself up to covetousness, so that he loved the wages of unrighteousness. At the time Balak sent messengers for him, he was double-minded, pursuing a course to gain and retain the favor and honor of the enemies of the Lord for the sake of rewards he received from them. At the same time, he was professing to be a prophet of God. Idolatrous nations believed that curses might be uttered which would affect individuals and even whole nations. As the messengers related their message to Balaam, he very well knew what answer to give them. But he asked them to tarry that night, and he would bring them word as the Lord should speak unto him. The presence in the hands of the men excited his covetous disposition. God came to Balaam in the night through one of his angels and inquired of him, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. The angel tells Balaam that the children of Israel are conducted under the banner of the God of heaven, and no curse from man could retard their progress. In the morning he arose and reluctantly told the men to return to Balak, for the Lord would not suffer him to go with them. Then Balak sent other princes, more of them in number and more honorable, or occupying a more exalted position, than the former messengers, and this time Balaam's call was more urgent. Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee coming unto me, for I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. His fear of God's power holds the ascendancy over his covetous disposition. Yet his course of conduct shows that his love of honor and gain was striving hard for the mastery, and he did not subdue it. He would have gratified his covetousness if he had dared to do it. After God had said that he should not go, he was anxious to be granted the privilege of going. He urged them to remain that night that he might make inquiry again of God. An angel was sent to Balaam to say unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. Yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. The Lord suffered Balaam to follow his own inclinations, and try, if he chose so to do, to please both God and man. The messengers of Balak did not call upon him in the morning to have him go with them. They were annoyed with his delay and expected a second refusal. Balaam could have excused himself and easily avoided going, but he thought that because the Lord the second time did not forbid his going, he would go and overtake the ambassadors of Balak. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Balaam because he went, and he sent his angel to stand in the way and to slay him for his presumptuous folly. The beast saw the angel of the Lord and turned aside. Balaam was beside himself with rage. 
the speaking of the beast was unnoticed by him as anything remarkable, for he was blinded by passion. As the angel revealed himself to Balaam, he was terrified and left his beast and bowed in humility before the angel. He related to Balaam the word of the Lord and said, I went out to withstand thee because thy way is perverse before me. It was important to Israel to overcome the Moabites in order to overcome the inhabitants of Canaan. After the angel had impressively warned Balaam against gratifying the Moabites, he gave him permission to pursue his journey. God would glorify his name even through the presumptuous Balaam before the enemies of Israel. This could not be done in a more effectual manner than by showing them that a man of Balaam's covetous disposition dared not for any promises of promotion or rewards pronounce a curse against Israel. Balak met Balaam and inquired of him why he thus delayed to come when he sent for him and told him that he had power to promote him to honor. Balaam answered, Lo, I am come unto thee. He then told him he had no power to say anything. The word that God should give him, that could he speak, and could go no further. Balaam ordered the sacrifices according to the religious rites. God sent his angel to meet with Balaam to give him words of utterance, as he had done on occasions when Balaam was wholly devoted to the service of God. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth, and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned unto him, and, lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifices, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his parable and said, Balak the king of Moab hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come, defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. Balaam spoke in a solemn, prophetic style. How shall I defy or devote to destruction those whom God hath promised to prosper? He declared in prophetic words that Israel should remain a distinct people, that they should not be united with, swallowed up by, or lost in any other nation, that they would become far more numerous than they then were, and he related their prosperity and strength. He saw that the end of the righteous was truly desirable, and prophetically expressed his desire that his life might end like theirs. Balak was disappointed and angry. He exclaims, What hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. Balak thinks it is the grand appearance of the Israelites in their tents, which Balaam views from a high mount that keeps him from cursing them. He thinks if he takes him to another place where Israel will not appear to such advantage, he can obtain a curse from Balaam. Again at Zophim, at the top of Pisgah, Balaam offered burnt offerings and then went by himself to commune with the angel of God. And the angel told Balaam what to say. When he returned, Balak inquired anxiously, What hath the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion, and lift himself up as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. Balak still flattered himself with the vain hope that God was subject to variation like man. 
Balaam informs him that God will never be induced to break his word or alter his purpose concerning Israel, and that it is in vain for him to hope to obtain a curse for his people or to expect him to reverse the blessing he has promised to them. And no enchantment or curse uttered by a diviner could have the least influence upon that nation that has the protection of omnipotence. Balaam had wished to appear to be favorable to Balak and had permitted him to be deceived and think that he used superstitious ceremonies and enchantments when he besought the Lord. But as he followed out the command given him of God, he grew bolder in proportion as he obeyed the divine impulse, and he laid aside his pretended conjuration, and looking toward the encampment of the Israelites, he beholds them all encamped in perfect order under their respective standards at a distance from the tabernacle. Balaam was permitted to behold the glorious manifestation of God's presence overshadowing, protecting, and guiding the tabernacle. He was filled with admiration at the sublime scene.